Yes. Say, God can use me. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Do you want him to? Yes. yes. Let, let go a little further. God could use me despite me. Yes. Let's go a little further. God could use me even when I don't feel like it. In fact, the chances he'll use yes. you the most when you don't feel like That's it. Right. Um, I just had a couple of things happen today that are quite fascinating. I, I really believe that in what I'm about to tell you happened when I was away and what happened on Sunday. Um, the Holy Spirit's no man's debtor. I, uh, I'm not one of those people that pre-prepares messages. I'm a person that waits on the Lord for him to speak and then... As I'm going to speak, then I will ask the Lord what the message is. But for some reason, on a Saturday, the Lord gave me a pre-prepared message as a result of what happened while I was away. And uh, I wrote down these seven points, me not knowing that Chris was going to be sick. And uh, when I wrote down the seven points, I didn't think that they were for that message, that church I was going to, didn't feel it. But the moment I heard that Chris was sick, I knew why God had given me the message. Right. Our problem was getting the message over here, yeah. all right? And I was 40 minutes late to a church I'd never been to and had to walk in. And you talk about ill-prepared, but I had to be prepared. And I had to walk in, and I was laughing with Homer. Homer talks a lot. Yeah. That's not just it. He just does. And he, and he talks loud. And so I'm driving this car, which I, I, I had to drive because we'd rented, I, and I'm so, trying to prepare myself for the place I've never been. And Homer's chatting with me about everything he thinks, because just Homer talks, he just, just how he is. And I'm thinking, God, how do I prepare without telling Homer to be quiet? <laughs> right? And it just felt like, Homer, be quiet. You know, it didn't feel right, you know. So I was going to call Rosie and say, Rosie, would you tell Homer to be quiet? But... <laughs> But God is no man's debtor. That's right. And I literally walked in in time to walk on the platform. I'd never heard the worship, never met the pastor, never met anyone. And yet God is no man's debtor. Right. And if you are prepared, God can do anything with you. Amen. And I want to say this to you, anything. Yes, so what had happened, you know, I don't know why he thought these guys weren't about the best preachers I've ever heard. These guys were white T.D. Jakes. Some of the greatest preaching I've ever heard. I just sat there dumbfounded. One of them was so excellent. I mean, you could have sat there for five hours. It was spellbinding. But I noticed there was no ministry <coughs> after the thing. That's it. Yeah. And so I kind of was swallowing deep. And I said, oh, God, have you taken me out of my depth? And then, uh, you know, another one gets up before me in the morning and, and then they have Chuck Pierce and all sorts of things going on. And they were all there. And I just said, Lord. And I said, I remember this thing that you taught me. In my weakness, your strength is perfected. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'm asking you in my weakness. I can't handle the way they preach. I said, but I do have something you've given me. But I had 40 minutes. And as I stood up, there was this strange feeling. You know that strange feeling that comes on all over you? Yes. And my mouth went dry because I was so nervous, so I had to stop and get him to open a bottle of water. And as he opened the bottle of water, I jumped off the platform. And I, I, I prophesied, boom, 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 over four people. And, then, and one of them just went like this and then jumped back on the platform and then something began to release. Right. Then jumped off the platform and began to touch people, as I touched people, like electricity shot into the auditorium. The worship leader who hadn't even been touched, who actually is a pastor in this town, started to shake all day for eight hours because he, and literally the leader's wife kept saying, don't come near me, don't come near me. Because in my moment of weakness, the glory of God comes out. So it then made me write this message, okay? And the message was, you know, that David had strengthened himself in the Lord. And some of you that were here on Sunday, and there is not one of us that doesn't need those moments where we're strengthened in the Lord. Yes. And, and the Lord then added to it today. And this is what Paul said in, in Philippians 4 and verse 13. But I can do 
all things through Christ who strengthens me. Contextually, he's saying, I know how to be without and I know how to be with a lot. And it doesn't make any difference because I've learned something that Christ strengthens me whatever my circumstance, whatever it is I'm dropped into, the purpose of Christ is to strengthen me. Now listen to this. He doesn't say Jesus. He says Christos. He said the anointed one strengthens me. Now it's very interesting. If you read 2 Corinthians uh, and, and chapter 12 and verse 9, it literally says my strength is perfected in your weakness. The word there is the word that we get power from, dunamis. It's the same word that Jesus used in Acts 1 and verse 8. He said, you'll receive power, dunamis, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So watch it. He's saying something here, that the, the Holy Spirit who empowers you is the one who strengthens you. That, the word there is not just strength, but it strengthens. So it actually means the one who endues you. So now listen to it again. I can do all things from, by the one who endues me. In other words, the anointed one, Christos, sends forth the empowerment of Christos to empower you with endowment in every circumstance that you are put into. Now, all things are all things. In other words, there's going to be everything happen to you in your life. But if you understand what Christ is up to in your life, for instance, I'll throw one out. When you get tempted to do something that you, 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 you wished you'd never got tempted to do, and you're right in the middle of it, if I can teach you in a few minutes what to do, you can lean on the, on the endure. Yes, and right there, while you're tempted, you can ask him to empower you against the temptation. Does this make sense? Yes. And so in all things, there's not one thing that you are going to live that Christ himself has not set up to empower you to meet all right so in other words the 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 dunamis of God is there to endue you so what happened to me that day and it shocked me as much as Homer what happened to me that day was as I cried out to him I must have touched something that made him do what he does but it's when you get involved that often he gets involved you see so, so all things is all things. So I was going to throw a few all things at you. And while you are getting ready for your all things, I'm going to drink, drink some water. See, Paul talks about without and with. Now watch this. You need to be empowered for poverty. Because what, what most people do when they go in a season without, they, they're empowered by their tongue, which moans at God. And their tongue complains that God isn't fair, etc. When really what the Lord wants to do is to walk you through something that he knows he can walk you through by empowering you in that moment. She said, so I've been empowered to be without. Hands up those who have ever been without. But really, how many of you that were without asked for empowerment to walk it? All right. But there's another thing. He says, I know how to be without but I know how to be with. Now, one of the hardest things to do in the world is to live without, but a harder thing is to live with. Because you see, even even Proverbs says, Lord, don't make me too poor as I might steal. And don't make me too rich as I might not need you. And one of the greatest empowerments of life is to actually walk in success or to walk in, in prosperity or to walk in position. See, it's one thing to see some of the votes change, but suddenly some of those people that just got voted in will change, unless they're empowered not to change. But I've got a good message for you. Dutch Sheets gets a phone call as he's coming in to preach, and it's one of the uh, members of the House of Representatives. And he called him, he said, I'm calling you to encourage you. Thank you for everything you do. But you need to know what's going on in Congress. He said, there are a group of people in Congress that know what's going on. And and they are seeking the Lord and preparing themselves to get a breakthrough in Congress. So you think nothing's going on, but you need to be empowered to be successful. 
if you're not strengthened in success, I, I, the stories I've heard in my life about people who the moment they got money, they left the church because now they don't need God. You need God when you're having a rough time. What happens when you're having a good time? You see? And suddenly, I don't, I'm no longer committed. Suddenly, I don't turn up to the things I used to turn up to. Why? Because I'm, I, I'm now wealthy or whatever it is. I'm prosperous or I'm doing well. And what Paul is saying, I found out how to be empowered in success. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, well, it's never happened to me yet. You don't know what God might do with you yet. But you need to know that there's an empowerment from God, an enduring for God to walk in success. If not, can I just say this to you? You can be one of the most arrogant people on the face of the earth because you thought God gave it to you because of you rather than God giving it to you because of him. And if you don't know how to be empowered in success and failure, in smallness and bigness, you've got to understand this. And sometimes in trouble. Isn't it interesting when Paul is speaking in 2 Corinthians, he's crying out in his weakness. He's crying out in a buffeting. He's crying out. I I hate being devil conscious. And when I went to this church over there on Sunday, they said to us, obviously the enemy is attacked. I thought, yeah, it's been pretty good all morning. (laughs) They said he's attacked. Half the church has gone down with a virus. We hate this. We wanted you to see. I I said, listen, I've been in the ministry for years. I don't care who's here. I said, and whatever's prophesied will go into the atmosphere, so don't worry about it. But, but the enemy was attacking all sorts of things. And then he'll attack you sometimes because you just were used. Because he'll then try and get you to be put off ever being used again. All right? But sometimes your trouble or weakness, the word weakness means physical, moral, financial, and emotional. So walking among you without words of knowledge, how many of you have ever had an emotional time? If you don't tell the truth, you get words of knowledge, right? You have an emotional time and you, at that moment, don't think you even want to go to church. But God can empower you to overcome your emotional weakness. And, And folks, I'm just telling you, you will never ever have a day where there isn't something. Now, sometimes it's financial weakness. I mean, I just got a bill, for instance, $12,400. Now, what intonation? That's a good word to use. It was a bill. But thank God I knew it was coming. But God empowered me before the bill came, and I began to set money aside for the bill. But that could have floored me if I hadn't been ready. And I started seeking the Lord for the money, for the bill, before the bill came. Does this make sense to you? And, and so sometimes it can be, uh, you, you better start understanding that every one of us has a temptation point. Even the ones that, that walk around like you float on air. I mean, if I were to look at you and ask the Lord, because I get the strangest things happen to me. People text me, and there's people text me. I had a total unknown. Her husband was incredibly well-known and has just passed away, and text me about me going to the church. As she texts me, as she texts me, God talks to me about her and the church. You see? So, so you know, God can tell us anything about anything. Right. And, and the church has been taken down to nothing, and the Lord told me how much he liked what she was doing. And what he was going to do as a result of what she's doing. When I told her what he said, she said, I want to fall on the floor. I want to fall right on the floor. Someone else sent me four pictures of their house. As they sent me the four pictures of the house, I walked into the sanctuary and I saw the pictures of the house. And then I saw a red stamp go across the pictures of the house in red, paid off. So, so... You know, God's up to, he's good, I'm going to take you somewhere. But do you understand, every one of us needs something from the Lord at any time. You need to know what your temptations are. You need to know what what your Achilles heel is. One of you, it might be a sexual temptation. Don't look up as if people will see you. (laughs) Another one might be a gossip temptation. Another one that you might be so easily offended that the enemy knows how to offend you with anything, anytime, by anyone. You need to know how to empower against those weaknesses. You need to know they're there or you get irritated in traffic. Or 
You see what I'm saying? And you've got to know what that thing is so that you can ask the Lord for the empowerment in that thing of your life. In all things, the Lord endues me. I need to get up with myself. Sometimes trouble comes. When trouble comes, you, you don't always know it's coming. Sometimes you get little sneak pre-warnings by the Spirit. Sometimes you don't. One minute you're not in it, the next minute you are in it. For instance, Chuck Pierce was due to come to the conference. He gets on a plane, there's a mechanical problem with the plane. Now, Chuck's flown way more than I ever have, right? He gets on the plane and there's a problem with the plane. They replace the part and send it out onto, onto the, the, the runway, begins to take off and the part goes on fire. So now he's on a plane on fire and, and they're in danger. He comes back in, instead of moping and carrying on, and God, why didn't you help? Of course, God helped, as you would be dead. So instead of that, he goes straight to his office, and, and I've got some of it for you later on, and, and starts to give this constant prophecy and, and set it up. He, he, he was empowered. He knew he had prayed before. He's flown enough to know, Lord, help me in these times of going out and coming in. Do you understand? Trouble doesn't come when you plan it. Trouble comes sometimes circumstantially, and trouble comes sometimes because the enemy does plan it. And you could say, you could say to me, well, I'm not worth attacking. <laughs> then you're not a child of God. Right. So just tell me, I'm not a child of God, I'm not worth attacking. Amen. Now say to me, I am a child of God, I child of God. and I might be worth attacking. Amen. How about the enemy saying to you his first famous words? Has God said? God doesn't seem to be doing this, so maybe he didn't mean that. What about the prophecy that you received? And it's beyond you. That's a shock. All prophecies are beyond you. God's view versus your view. The moment you get the prophecy, the opposite happens. You must have heard God. Because it's like when Elisha's about to get the mantle, Elijah tries to put him off because he's trying to stop him before he gets it. You catch it. So it can be trouble, it can be strife, it can be difficulties, it can be the valley of the shadow of death, it can be loss. But we need to understand that in all things, God wants to endure us with the power of the Holy Spirit to walk whatever that is. You're catching that. But sometimes God wants to use you. Oh, what a shock. He wants to actually use you. And sometimes he will try to use you beyond you. And sometimes you will say, Lord, I can't do that. And he'll say, I know that. That's why I'm asking you to do it. So it can be me in doing you to do something you can't do. I can use you to do something beyond you if you will let me and do you in the moment I ask you to do it. Are you catching this? Sometimes he might want to anoint you. And anointing is beyond you. Anointing equips you to do things that you can't do. You're being endued. So, so what it's really saying in all the circumstances of life, whether it be natural, whether it be physical, whether it be attack, whether it be financial, that the Holy Spirit has been sent by Christos himself to endue you. He's not, he's not touched you. The Holy Spirit's not touched you and left you. He's in a constant endoing you to be able to do whatever the all things are in life. Does this make sense? Yes. So I was going to show you a little bit more because I feel like we're in a strange preparation time. I'm trying to tell you I sometimes hear God. And I'm trying to give you a warning that the Lord's up to something. I'm, I'm a bit scared of what he might ask me to do, actually. I'm a bit bothered. Because, you see, naturally, because of what sickness I've walked, I get extremely exhausted. And I'm thinking, you're going to ask me to do what? For instance, there, were, there was an Australian like that there. And the Holy Spirit, when he just went, bah, 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 the Australian came up to me and said, I had just had a vision of you. He said, you're to come to Australia. He said, and you're to come to Australia, and I, I need to set it up for you. This is going to be interesting for you. I'm going to need to set it up for you because I can see you going from place to place to place starting fires. So, you know that's been prophesied many times to me. But this is what I said to me. Lord, you're going to send me to Australia as tired as I am. 
See, can you catch it? In my weakness. And he said, are you open to that? I said, I better be. I serve God. He said, what about January? I went, let's just take a time. Just take a time. <laughs> uh, well, slow it down. Slow it down. We continued to talk. And he said, hey, do you know Darren Begley? I said, yes, I do know Darren Begley. In fact, we used to minister together, and we were kind of buddies. He said, I'm his spiritual son. There it goes. There's the connection. And Darren fathered him in Australia, and now he's over here, and the guy has a problem. You'd like him. The reason you'd like him, because he can't stop making businesses work. And he, kingdom businesses, and he's got a gift to start businesses, start businesses, start businesses, and they just work. And he said, I'm here not only to finance the church, but to do what the ministers won't do. Ministers don't like talking about money. I'll talk about it. He said, because that's what I mean. And isn't that interesting that God instantly puts me in a situation of something I'm thinking, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, I've had such an interest in Australia. I know all the states. I know the capitals of all the states. I know where they are all situated. I stay up sometimes and look where everything is in Australia. I just, because, because why? Because God's put an interest in me. You see? So, so I'm just trying to throw you. So don't, don't sit there and say, yeah, but there's a limit to how much I'll do for you, Lord. Don't talk like that. You don't know what he might do at what hour. In, in doing, if you get dropped into something, and I'll show you this, you need to say, Holy Spirit, right now. Right now. See? So watch this. He, he starts off as a comforter. He, according to John 14, 16, he comes to help you. If he comes to help you, that means he comes to help you. It doesn't mean he's on and off. He doesn't just come to help you for the first, I'm going to help you for the first few months, then you're on your own. What it means is, He's there to help you. It means he's always there to help you. He's been sent to help you. Not just me, you. The trouble with most of us is we don't know how to get the help. All right? The secondly, he's not only there to help you, but he's there to strengthen you, Ephesians 3.16, in the inner man. This is what Paul said. He strengthens you in the inner man. Why in the inner man? Because your strength is not linked to what you can bench press. Your strength is linked to what you can withstand. Your strength is linked to, to what you can receive. Your strength is linked to what you can carry. Just because someone's quiet doesn't mean that they're not incredibly strong in God. Your strength is, is, is literally linked to what God could use you for. You find Ephesians 3.16 and go all the way to 20. It literally says he can take you from measure to measure to measure according to how you are strengthened. So Christos is wanting to strengthen you in your inner man. Don't get stuck on one thing. Well, I'm lonely. Well, this. Well, that. Someone let me down. Look at the bigger picture. Amen. That sheet's preached an amazing word. In fact, I'm going to write to him and ask him, can I borrow his statement? And he said, did you know that God dreams? If you don't know that God dreams, turn to Ephesians 1 and you'll find out that God dreams. Because even before the foundation of the world, he saw you and dreamed what he would do with you. We have been created in the image of God, therefore we dream. So all men have the ability to dream. There is a dream in every man or every woman. But he said the big thing we need is that God wants to dream his dream in you and not just you dream your dream. Now, what I'm telling you, have you ever had the strangest feelings that God wants you to do something way beyond you are? It is God dreaming and then, of course, God working that through you, right? So God has to strengthen you in advance for things that he might want you to do. Like when he showed me the picture during worship and asked me, you know, are you prepared? And, you know, I hate those questions. Have you ever had God ask you a question? It seems to be, what's that for? Like one day I was standing at the front of the church and the Lord said to me, would you go to Russia for me? This was before they attacked Ukraine. And I said, well, how do I answer that? You, the Lord, are asking me, the pleb, <laughs> would I go to Russia for you? Well, if you tell me to go to Russia, I'll go to Russia. I've always told you I'll do whatever you say. Is there something in this, Lord? And then, literally, he never answered. <laughs> he just wanted to know if I would, if he asked. Yeah. Now, right now, Lord, no. 
He got hold of Dutch sheets. This is so important. He got a hold of Dutch sheets in a prayer time, and he said he started talking to him, and Dutch started answering, and he, Dutch found himself going backwards like this into the corner of the room until the Lord got him in the corner of the room and said to him, if I wanted you to never preach again, and if I wanted you to never write again, and all I wanted you to do was to be an intercessor, would you do it? Now, you can all shout amen, but Dutch said I was being real clever back. I said, Lord, you know that's not what you call me to. And the Lord said, that's not what I asked. I said to you, if that's what I wanted you to do, would you do it? And then he adds something, and would you do it and be happy? So Dutch says, I would do it, but I'm just telling you, I wouldn't be happy. Unless the Lord strengthens you to do it. You understand what I'm saying to you? I think I missed that when I first moved from my nation to this nation. I, I missed some of the, 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 the transference of it. And I found out, I, I did it because I, was, I, I knew that the way God opened I was to do it, but I wasn't happy. And the Lord had to show me, unless you embrace the culture that I've put you in, you will never succeed in that culture. In other words, I had to be strengthened by God in the inner man to walk in a culture that's not my culture. Anybody here from another culture? Julie's got her hand up at home. Suddenly, you're having to embrace something different. It's even within the United States. There are cross cultures and, and people are crossing over and God wants to do something. So I'll tell you what God said. So let's see if this was God. He said, I'm about to bring in a lot of black people into the church. Are you ready? The number one, I like the thought of that. But number two, the cultural crossing is huge. It's like Rudy doesn't remember everything he says to me. Rudy said to me one time when he first came into the church, he said, it's one thing having to learn to walk with white people. That's what he said, because it's, it was a cross culture. And he said, it's another thing to have to walk with a white person who's English. <laughs> so I was really pinpointed, it's really your fault, because I've got to cross one culture, then there's you. But that's what God is trying to prepare you for, because God has to empower you to cross culture. He has to empower you to walk with each other. You, you catch it, what I'm saying? So God wants to strengthen you in the inner man for anything he wants to do with you. All right? So watch that. He's drawn alongside to help. He strengthens you in the inner man. All right? So, so that's two ways. Number three, he prays through you and never stops. The Holy Spirit. Come on. I, I want to be real. I wish I wasn't online for a second. But have you ever done something wrong? One person, Jeannie, anything? Yeah. Anybody else? Ever? And come on, and you're really down on yourself, yeah. honestly. And, and you, could, you could take yourself to the woodshed, or you could cancel yourself out for a little while, or your spirit goes dead because you're so fed up with you. Have you noticed that those times the Holy Spirit sings songs inside you that you wouldn't want to sing at that moment? Why? Because he prays through you and never stops praying. He has been sent to endure you despite you. You need to put your hands up and say, use me despite me. Touch me despite me. And in fact, Lord, when you do, I'll lift up my hands and say, you did that despite me. You catching it? So he's always praying through you and sometimes shares his prayers with other people. I was shocked I got a word for someone that was, you know, I haven't been in contact for a long time. And naturally, honestly, naturally, didn't want a word for them. I wasn't thinking of them with relish or anything like that. They weren't crossing my mind. And suddenly the Lord said to me, when I was out literally in another city, he said to me, I, I want you to tell this person this. And I said to the Lord, but that guy's a prophet. He doesn't need me to tell him anything. He said, I want you to tell him this. So I, 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 I called the guy, I said, no, text the guy. I said, look, it's been a long time since we talked, but the Lord just said this to me. He said, oh, thank you so much. He said, you don't know this, but this has begun to happen and begins to write back on what's happening. And then says this, I pray for you 
all the time. You mean the Holy Spirit is sharing with another prophet to pray about me? See, when God wants to share his prayer with others to help you be strong. In fact, I promise you, if you go through a bad time and can't pray for yourself, he'll have someone praying, and it won't because you went on the prayer list. He doesn't need your prayer list. He's got his own. But he's working to strengthen you. He's on your side. He's here to finish the work. He's here to get the dream fulfilled in your life. You're catching this. He also is the endurer of power. You receive power after that which the King James, after that which the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Who's he talking to? Anyone that wanted it. I want to say this to you. You should be asking constantly, constantly, constantly for the enduing of power. Christos, this is what you do. You strengthen me. Therefore, you want to endue me with power on a constant basis. Folks, if you felt power 122 years ago, you might have leaked. The batteries might have run out. The fuse blew. And, and he wants to strengthen us at all times because you don't know what you might get dropped into at any moment by God that he wants you to be endued with power for it. So he's praying for you, but you've got to be saying, do me, do me, do me constantly. This is going to be my prayer. Christos, you're strengthening me. Therefore, I want to be endued by you. Now, I, I even say this is pretty good teaching. Why is it good teaching? Because we need this. And even if you, you don't like listening to sermons, listen to this one. Because this is what Christos wants to do. He doesn't want to save you alone. He wants to empower you so that you can walk this whole life. All right? Now, sometimes he wants to, he wants to anoint you. And I found out about anointing that what's dangerous about anointing is that we learn to rely on the anointing that we know we got. But how many know that he can anoint you in all things at any time he wants, whether it be a permanent anointing or a touch anointing? And so that any circumstance I walk into, he can anoint me for it if I know how to reach into him. All right, so I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So he is strengthening me. I've learned how to walk in tandem. Now, I want to take you back to what happened on Thursday and what happened on Sunday. I'm just using me as an illustration because I was there. If I hadn't been there, I couldn't have given you the illustration. So I'm crying out to God in weakness. God begins to quicken me. But nothing would have happened if I, unless I had gone in tandem. You know, there was an older Yorkshire, Yorkshireman who said to his bride-to-be, can you ride tandem? Which means, can you ride on a, on, a, on a bike that two people ride on? I'll be at the front, you'll be on the back, but we're running together. Can you ride tandem or have you got to be independent? Because if you can ride tandem, the Holy Spirit can do anything with you. But we've got to learn to ride tandem. So it took me to have the guts to step out to do what I felt he was doing. And if I hadn't stepped out, he wouldn't have done it because he was using me as the vessel. So you've got to learn to ride tandem. So this is how you do it. You make a decision. It's called Psalm 84 and verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in God. I've made a decision, the decision of my life. I will make God my strength for every situation of my life. I will look to God for his endowment in every situation of my life. I will look to him for strength to win, to lose. I look for him the strength to, to raise children. I look for him for the strength to be married. I look for him to be the strength to work, work in my job. Whatever it is, I'm looking, this is my life. This is my decision. I look to God to be my strength. Blessed are those who make God their strength. Now, have you done that? No, no, you, I didn't say, did you do that once? Have you done that? who set their hearts on pilgrimage, who follow the way of the strength of the Lord. In other words, you've made it your lifestyle. You see? All right? I, I want to throw something in that I just missed it for a second because I want to bring it in right now. But one of the things that the Holy Spirit does, according to Isaiah 40, is He renews us. Now, how many times do you need a renew? 
I, I've noticed I need renewing after I minister. I've noticed I need renewing uh, naturally because of something I fight. Uh, how many of you need a renew? Yeah. If you're going through a tough time, you need a renew. Yeah. If you're going through a successful time, you need a renew. In other words, he wants to constantly renew you. I'm saying that to get you somewhere. So once I've set something in as stone that God is my strength, God is my strength, God is my strength, God is my strength. What I've done is I've decided to ride tandem. I've decided to go with God and he will be my strength in every city. There will be nothing that I walk into that I don't think of leaning on God for my strength. See, what we're always doing, if we're not careful, we're always thinking of ministry. But what you don't realize is life is ministry because we're all servants of God. Have you ever felt, come on, be real with me for a minute. Have you ever felt like you just don't want to pray? Have you ever said to the Lord, you need to help me pray? What did you just do? You looked to the God of strength and you asked him that he would strengthen you to pray. Because I just don't feel like it. Have you ever praised God when you really don't want to? Yes. How did you do that? You asked God for strength. Have you ever had someone really... Sorry, I nearly got excited there. And of course, we're in a church, nobody ever gets excited. Have you ever been really right on the edge of being excessively annoyed with someone? Yes. To the point that if you were given permission... You would know how to plant a shot across the bow. And then you have to say, oh God. This is only to the people like me that have Irish somewhere in their blood. Oh God, strengthen me because I would love to squarely deck that one. Come on. You're all not like me. Some of you look and say, pure, I've never wanted to take anybody in my life. Yeah, but you have opened the, the guard of your mouth and let that thing come out like an asp. Come on, that's right. And you've ripped someone's head off. But if you'd gone to God for strength, you'd have put your tongue back in your mouth and locked down the sardine can. Are you catching me? This is life. This is not just laying hands on people. I need to be strengthened sometimes to shut up. But I'd like to give him a piece of my mind. How about shutting your mind up? We have the anointing to bring every thought captive. But we need to be strengthened sometimes. Yeah, but I've always been a blurt. What's a blurt? Someone that blurts it all out. Then how many of you know you need some strength? So as we learn to ride tandem in strength, we need to learn to reach out to God in practice in every circumstance of our life. We need to learn when to speak, not to speak, when to react, not to react. We need to learn all those things so that the strength of God enables us to live as Christians in this life. You catching me? Have you ever prayed over your greatest temptation? But have you ever prayed for strength in your greatest temptation? That God would strengthen me to say no, because it tells me that the grace of God teaches us to say no. Now, he can teach you, but if you haven't got the strength for the teaching to work, I know the word, brother, I know the word, brother, and the word says, yeah, but the word not working just says. But if I'm strengthened, the word does. Now, let's just add a, a part. I'm just trying to teach you how this works, all right? Because there's something going on. God wants to strengthen this house for what he wants to do in this house. And even strengthen you to forgive people that have not treated us right. All right? Now, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is perfected in weakness. How many of you know that without knowing how to reach in for grace, 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 I'll never be able to take on the strength because strength comes by grace. So you need to learn the prayer of grace. Lord, I need grace. I don't, I don't understand grace. Just pray it. <laughs> but you need to teach me the doctrine of grace. No, you just need to ask for it. It's God's ability where your ability fails. It's God giving you the ability to do something you can't do. 
And you need to make that the prayer with strength. Oh God, I want to walk into your grace and I want you to strengthen me. So I'm praying for and I'm reaching out for in faith because I've already found out you want to do it. Therefore, in faith, Lord, I know I'm not good enough. You're not arguing with God. You're arguing with yourself. I was talking to Chris today about mercy. The problem with mercy, it's real simple. Come with boldness to the throne of grace to receive mercy. We've all got that. But we come to the bo- boldly to the throne of grace. Most of us don't come boldly because we don't think we're good enough to come boldly. And then secondly, we don't receive because we don't think we're good enough to receive. So work, mercy can't work when you don't have mercy on yourself. And if everything works through mercy, even ministry, how many of you know, if you can't have mercy on you, you're never going to go any further than tying up your shoe. That was good. That was just... (laughs) What am I saying to you? We've got to learn to have the grace of God to say, Dennis, I know you're a twit. I know that. In fact, you're such a twit, you're a kettle of them. But the bottom line is, if you don't forgive you, God can't forgive you. You'll never move on. You'll never step anywhere. And what we are, we're more conscious of our weakness than we are of all the success that God has given us in our life. We're always thinking about the one thing that, Lord, I'm really good with you, but there's that one thing. And when that one thing's gone, there'll be another one. So we need to learn to have the grace to put mercy into practice. And the Bible tells us what does God require of you, but to love mercy. In other words, love what he loves. All right. So you've got these two factors. You've got to learn to rely on his strength. And you've got to learn to go to grace. And then you've got to literally learn to entangle with God. Because it tells in Isaiah 40 that those who entangle themselves with God shall renew their strength. Now what does it mean entangle yourself with God? It means include God in every entanglement of your life. You've got to understand, if he saved you ugly people, I haven't finished yet. If he saved you ugly people before you knew Christ when you were ugly people, if he saved you knowing how ugly you really were, why would he drop you now when he started redemption? You see, if we acknowledge him in all our ways, he will make our path straight. That means when you're tempted, say so. Like, I did something so stupid yesterday. And I don't know if it was all me. But I I wouldn't consider myself a terrible driver. I'm not a risk taker. I used to be. And I'm driving along, and I go to turn left, and I see back down there, there's there's a school bus, and some other cars just come through the light. I measured the distance, and I think, that's simple. I just go through there. They're not here yet. But he was driving faster than I thought he was. So as I turned, he was either texting, talking, or not thinking. He didn't see me to the last second. He jams his foot on the brake, and I said to myself, Dennis, that was so dumb. So all the way home and half the night, I kept saying to myself, dumb, dumb. What a dumb thing to do. That was a school bus. The truth is, it was silly. It wouldn't have been if he'd seen me, but he didn't see me. But I took the risk thinking he did see me. Anybody ever done anything dumb, dumb? Now, here's the point. I put my indicator on. It didn't stop the fact that I did something dumb. Now, right now, I've got to get God entangled with me in the mistake that I seemingly made. Now, I can drive her along saying, well, it was his fault. No, I still took the turn. Does that make sense to you? And so I've got to entangle God with that. I've got to entangle God with wrong thoughts. I've got to entangle God when I react wrong. I've got to entangle God in everything because I can't be entangled with God unless he's entangled in everything. Are you catching it? For instance, you know, a couple of girls not married here. I'm going to see two or three. And along comes a guy. Are you that entangled with God that you can say to God, I I don't know about that guy? Or have you rather entangled yourself with the guy that you've disentangled yourself with God? Seen it happen. 
But if you entangle yourself with God, you say, Lord, I want you to prove to me because I'm a bit thick and I'm feeling feelings. Things are flaring. The Bunsen burner has been lit. Passions are around. Is he? Is he not? Because I'm so entangled with you that you won't let me. And if, if he's not the one, strengthen me to say no. The light has gone red. And strengthen you enough if he threatens you with silly things. No. I'd rather be entangled with my God than entangled with you. Are you catching this? So you entangle God in everything in your life. You've got to get into the practice of praying these simple words. Help me. Lord, if you want me to minister, help me. No, you're really good at this word. No, Lord. Don't say that. Help me. Help me, Lord. It looks like I've got myself in a mess. Help me. It looks like I've got myself associated with something I shouldn't. Help me. Strengthen me. Entangle yourself with me so that I'm strengthened and renewed to be able to come out of this strong in God and not give place to dum-dum. In other words, if we create this lifestyle... That it doesn't matter what God asks us to do, where he sends us. Now, I'm not telling you that you're all called to, to stand behind a pulpit, but he might tell you to. He might suddenly say to you, I want you to preach. And you might say, I don't want me to preach. And then he'll say, little problem here, me God, you not. I know the end from the beginning, and I know what will happen if you do what I ask you to do. Like when he, was, he prophesied to Sasha, I want you to lead worship, she probably went, you are joking but in obedience she did it and guess who strengthened her you're catching this so so we've got to draw him into anything we're thrown into and ask him ask him there's something about asking god there's something about asking god and it literally tells us in james don't think that god's not listening to you and don't act like he won't do it he wants to give you wisdom he wants to give you strength he wants to strengthen you. I want you to get in practice of getting strengthened by God. So whatever he wants to do, you have got used to it. Yes, Lastly, but not leastly, just because of time. Pray in tongues. I believe the prayer language, according to 1 Corinthians 14, has been given to us to create within us a habitation of God. It creates a place of strength, and it is the one thing that Satan goes after. He tells you, you sound stupid. Then you say, well, then you are stupid to say I sound stupid. Because it's outside of my natural mind, and I'm telling you, pray in tongues, pray in tongues, pray in tongues. As much as you can, you are, you are bringing God the endure, God the Holy Spirit, the dynamis of God. You're bringing him into your flow. Walk around the kitchen, praying in tongues. Pray in tongues in the car. Just start to develop that lifestyle that starts the endure working. You working alongside the one that is working alongside you. He wants to strengthen you. So that you can stand up and say, whatever God throws me into, I can do anything through Christos who strengthens me. I can walk through that. I can walk through that. I can minister that. It doesn't matter what he asks me to do. Just remember this, and this is my last illustration, at least for now. Um, when Paul Doty was told by God, paralyzed, to go to a town in Arkansas, the pastor had been praying for God to heal the sick and had lost faith that he would. He didn't believe God would do it, but he wouldn't stop asking that God would do it. Paul turns up and he knocks on the door, he goes into the church and, and, and sees the receptionist and says, is the pastor in? And she says, no, he's in a deacon's meeting. He said, you probably need to call him out here. He's paralyzed. He's got one arm working and one arm totally withered. And the pastor comes out, listen to what happened. The pastor comes out and Paul says, God's told me that you are to pray for him. 
And the pastor said, you got the wrong guy. Now watch this. The Holy Spirit working this out. Paul knows he's the one. He doesn't know he's the one. So Paul says, I'm telling you again, all you got to do is lay hands on me and pray for me. God's told me, if you will pray for me, he will heal me. Now think this through. He doesn't think he can do it. God's got most of us where we don't think we can do it. And he's got his paralyzed arm, so the man puts his hand on his head and listen to what he prayed. Paul told me word for word. He said, Lord, you know that I've never seen you do anything like this. In fact, Lord, you know that I have a real problem believing you for this. But because I've been told to do it, I'm doing it. So I'm asking you, if it's your will, he prayed, will you heal this man? While he's praying that prayer, Paul's arm shoots out and shoots out the same size as the other arm. The man nearly drops in shock. Smith Wigglesworth wanted people healed and the guys knew God wanted him to do it. He didn't know it. So they arranged to be too busy during a healing meeting and, and, and called him and said, Smith, you're doing the healing meeting. He said, I, I'm not doing the healing meeting. I can't do a healing meeting. He said, yes, you can. I can't. Well, we can't come, so we'll either cancel it or you'll do it. Smith said the first person he prayed for, he didn't know who was more shocked, the person or him. <laughs> what did God do? He threw him into an arena that was beyond him and strengthened him in the middle of the arena and became one of the greatest voices of all time because God took him beyond so you've got to be prepared and start looking to God to be your strength. We as a church, I'm prophesying, we as a church need to say, Lord, strengthen us to walk through the valley. Strengthen us to walk on the mountaintop. Strengthen us for every circumstance. Come on, pray it. Strengthen us, Lord. Strengthen this church. Strengthen this eldership. Strengthen me to walk in success or weakness. Strengthen me in the inner man. Come alongside to help me. Renew me, Holy Spirit. It is the will of God. Strengthen me to walk in an anointing beyond me. Strengthen me whatever it is. Strengthen me for growth. Strengthen me for miracles. Strengthen me to go beyond where I am. Strengthen me to see what you see. Strengthen me to be what you want me to be. But strengthen me. Start it right now. Come in the middle of this church, Lord, and strengthen this church. Now, did anybody get it? Now, is anybody going to change their lifestyle? I want you to prophesy to this church, all of you. You become what God wants you to become. You point to anybody around you. You become what God wants you. God strengthen you. God strengthen you in whatever you're walking, whatever you're about to walk. God strengthen you. I don't know what he's going to tell you to do yet, but he, get, get strengthened now. Get set in it right now. Christos, strengthening me, I can do all things. Now come on, let's lift our hands and worship Him. Let the Word get deep in you. Let the truth make you alive. It's a Word of the Lord, I'm telling you. Is there something that you need is strengthened right now? I'm not asking you to be so loud. I'm asking you to lift your hand. Where is the area you need is strength in? Is it physical? Is it emotional? Is it financial? What are you saying, Lord, strengthen me in this? Come on, let God hear what you need be strengthened in. It might, it might be the grace to deal with something in your family. God, give me the strength. Spirit of God, work on me. I'm, I'm needing your strength right now to walk this. I'm needing your, your strength right now to do this. I, I'm needing your strength to walk in this relationship. Come on. I want you to get into this for a moment. That's all I want. You see, you say, well, could you minister to us? No, not till Sunday. What I'm wanting to try and do is get you in the mold of it. You catching me? Reach out. See, if I start making a habit of it, then I'm in the habit of it. 
Strengthen me in that sickness, Lord. Strengthen me in that valley. Give me strength to walk through this situation. Give me strength for the ministry you're calling me into. Got it? Now I'm going to ask you to pray for something for the whole church. I'm just going to ask you that God enable this church to stop being anesthetized to the voices that it has. Because what happens if we, you're anesthetized to the voices you have, you might miss the voice of God because he said to the angel of the church, right? He said not to the visiting preacher, right? So I want you to pray that God, God would stop this where people just go, oh, it's just Dennis, oh, it's just good. And you miss the voice of God. So I want you to pray. Come on, I want to hear your voices. Pray that God would break that stronghold out of our church. The same would go for the worship team. Amen. That we're not, we're not, we're, we're not missing what God is doing. You catching it? Shout these words out with me. Lord, make me hungry for your voice. Make me hungry for your presence. Don't let me miss one thing. Strengthen me in the inner man so I can grasp with all the saints what you're saying and doing. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name. So here's one last thought, and it's got nothing to do with the message, but it's everything to do. God will use prophecy. Now, what you don't know is you just heard one. The whole message wasn't a sermon. It was a prophecy. I was prophesying to you that God is saying something to you. So right now, you want to say, God uses prophecy to strengthen me. I receive that prophetic word. I receive it. And Lord, use me to prophesy over others. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give the Lord and the worship team a clap offering. Hallelujah.